Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is episode number 14. Jeez, it feels like episode 13 was literally yesterday. Of The Right Take. I'm Eric Landrum. I'm Jacob Grandstaff. And with Easter coming up, uh, well, the first big holiday that's coming up very, very soon, lots of travel arrangements I'm sure have been made or are already being made. I recommend that you guys all get those travel plans done quickly and get traveling as soon as possible. Enjoy these last few weeks, I think, of traveling because soon they are not going to last much longer. Because soon enough, uh, they're going to start asking for your papers, Jacob. They're going to start... Uh, they're going to start asking for papers to fly. I, I remember uh, friends of mine had predicted this for a, wh- a while. I was not skeptical about it. I actually was willing to accept that this was probably going to happen at some point. But I did not think it would happen this quickly. Biden. This story comes from our friends at National File, a great publication. The article is by none other than the master of National File himself, Tom Papert. <clears throat> Headline. Biden regime, nice touch, Tom, is developing vaccine passport Americans must have to engage in commerce. This quotes from a story by The Washington Post, of all things. So, no, this isn't Gateway Pundit. This isn't some conspiracy theory. Quote, private companies are working to develop a standard way of handling credentials, often referred to as vaccine passports. That would allow Americans to prove they have been vaccinated against the novel coronavirus as businesses try to reopen, end quote. That's from the Washington Post, uh, saying that, of course, those private companies are working with the Biden administration, but that the private companies are going to be taking the lead primarily on this initiative. So this is this is something that has been hinted at for a while that, of course, with the of course, they started with the masks, right? You are not allowed to fly unless you wear a mask. We've seen all the viral videos of people getting kicked off of planes for not wearing masks because they actually believe in freedom. But these airlines and the airlines are the most crucial ones, I think. And I said for the longest time, if we see any semblance of a covid vaccine passport soon, it will be the airlines that will spearhead this first because people need to fly. Right. And that's one thing that has a chokehold on a particular industry or form of commerce that people really need. People, most people in America need to be able to fly from place to place. Certainly guys like you and I do here in this particular area. The article goes on to say many businesses, quote, from cruise lines to sports teams, end quote, will require individuals to take the COVID-19 vaccine before they are offered business. The passports are expected to be free and available through applications for smartphones, the Post reported, which could display a scannable code similar to an airline boarding pass. I mean, I suppose that's better than having a barcode, you know, tattooed onto your neck or something, right? You know, that's that's just a little slightly less uh, less obvious than that. Americans without smartphone access should be able to print out the passports, developers have said. This is this this kind of goes back to something we had talked about before earlier on in the podcast. We've made it a very uh, common theme here. We've mentioned it multiple times here at the right take that we are on the right, yes, but we are not afraid to call out capitalism for the major problems that have arisen with this system over the recent years and especially the last few years with the coronavirus being one of the prime examples, the other being the race riots last year. This is the, the article notes as National Files Washington Post say The government is – they're working with private corporations, but they're not taking the lead on this. The corporations are. This is primarily being done from the side of the market. The government's just kind of working in tandem with it. So what they're doing here – it's very smart that the Biden regime is doing this regime, as Tom calls it. They are taking a step back to – allow themselves to have plausible deniability here. They can shrug and you know wipe their hands clean and say, oh, well, of course, we can't mandate that you take the vaccine and inject this into your body. We can't force you to do that. That would be that'd be unconstitutional. But if a bunch of private corporations decide that's what they want to do, then, well, uh, that that's their right. You know, that's their right as private companies. You know, we, we can't tell them what to do. We can't tell American Airlines or or Walmart or McDonald's what to do. And of course, most people are going to go along with it. People who try to speak up against it are going to be shut out. They're not going to be allowed. They, they can resist all they want. They can film themselves getting kicked off of American Airlines or getting kicked out of a Walmart or a McDonald's. But at the end of the day, that's not really going to turn the tide, I think. This is just – all this is to me is this is more proof that capitalism is just falling apart. It is not the free market system anymore that it was during the Cold War. This is – you can call it corporate capitalism. You can call it crony capitalism or what I think we should call it. This is corporate fascism, and it's about to get a lot worse before it gets any better. H.L. Mencken said the average man does not want to be free. He simply wants to be safe, and we're seeing that with the the masks wearing. You know, We criticize local governments for forcing businesses 
to make people wear a mask no matter how low the outbreak of coronavirus is in those communities. But we see, especially around the D.C. area, people are voluntarily walking around with masks on. When they're trail, alone. Right, when they're alone. They're trail hiking. They're riding a bicycle. You'll in their see, own cars. Right. My, uh, my neighbor the other day, she was out gardening in the morning, and she had a mask on while she was gardening. There's nobody else, nobody anywhere outside on the entire block, and she's out there gardening with a mask on. And so we see people are willing to limit their own freedom if it means that they can be safe. And we see this in more and more as society becomes more urbanized. You know, when we think of the American spirit, we think of American, you know, Americans wanting to be free. That was more or less a frontier mindset. Whenever, whenever you're trailblazing, you're going out by yourself or just your family or a few family and friends, you've got to – you value freedom. You don't want anybody telling you what to do, where you can go, where you can't go. But whenever people become – they move into close quarters, they live in communities that are – where people are extremely crowded, they become a lot more conscious of their safety than they do their freedom. And if they have to choose one, or the, um, one of, over the other, they're always going to pick their own safety. So with something like this, we got to look at where we got to be realistic about where this where this is going. Yes, obviously they're going to implement this, and what it's going to mean is if you want to travel by air, if you have not been vaccinated, you can take a COVID test. And I'm guessing that at the beginning, if you test negative, you may be allowed to ride without a mask. But I think a lot of airlines they're going to require you to wear a mask, uh, you know, continually in five, ten years from now, if you do not have a COVID passport. And this is just the reality of where we're at. So um, unless I mean, the only really the only relief from this situation would be if state governments were to crack down on corporations. But at this point, the corporations are more powerful than the federal government. So exactly what what can we really expect state governments to do in the face of this kind of corporate power? The, the only thing that's going to change this kind of mentality, this culture of totalitarianism, this march toward fascism, if you will, is a cultural shift among Americans. Americans are going to have to become more personally responsible. And we just – we don't have that in the culture right now. So this is mainly a cultural problem. We can blame the Biden administration for doing – and they're actually very smart for doing this. They obviously support the concept of a, of a COVID passport, and they understand that this would get struck down by the Supreme Court if they try to do it through federal fiat. So they're using corporations. And, of course – you know what? What are you going to do if you're a state like, let's say, Arkansas? What if corporations, every single corporation in your state, is demanding that whenever you enter the store, you have to either wear a mask or have a COVID passport? We see what's going on in Texas. Sure, Texas eliminated the mask mandate, but most places still require masks. You know, so what? What good does that do? If you're a little mom and pop shop, I guess you can you can go maskless. You can tell customers they can come in without a mask. But most of the major chains where most of the commerce happens still require masks. So at the end of the day, this is a cultural issue. This is something that you know, as long as the majority of Americans want something like this, then this is what's going to happen. Yeah, and you can tell, of course, the government and corporations alike are taking advantage of a pandemic like this, which, again, is still not the deadliest pandemic in human history, not by far. But they're still trying to take advantage of this and hyper sensationalize it and use it as an excuse for a power grab that would not have been possible. You know, like the Patriot Act in the aftermath of 9-11, they take advantage of something horrifying this once in a generation transformative event and they use it to just run with it and get as much power as possible institutionally and otherwise well and it's actually if you watch like jen saki in the in the you read liberal journalists their view of people in general not just americans but people is that they need to be guided by experts this is their worldview this is their mentality they, they can't believe, think for themselves correct yeah. correct they believe that people need health guidance so like it, they believe that when you think about it, like they're citing um, – they'll cite sources on masks and say, OK, well, masks work because this study and this study and that study. It's like, OK, look, I, I know what a mask is. Like I know thin masks don't work that well, but they work some. Medical masks obviously work. Otherwise, doctors wouldn't wear them. Like people have common sense and they can think these things through. They can decide for themselves in this situation, is it OK or should I wear a mask? Should I not wear a mask? But in their mind, you have to have – a, you have to have three citations to back up every single p opinion that you have. If you have an opinion, you better be able to – because it really – this is what they're drilled in when they're liberal arts classes, that any time that you state an opinion, you need to be able to back it up with credible sources. So you need to be sure that you have 
book, chapter, and verse on this. You need to be able to make sure that you put everything in Chicago-style citation so everyone knows exactly where you got your information. So even if it's common sense stuff that really doesn't need a verbal citation, they're going to make sure that they that you, that you know that they have consulted the experts on this. And because the average common person who's a laborer hasn't you know, read all these medical journals and whatever, they believe that they know best for how to protect people and that people should submit to the soft tyranny of the of the medical community. But, uh, you know, this is just their this is their worldview. Whenever Democrats win elections, this is what this is the kind of stuff that happens. Now, let's counter that out with some good news, because there is some good news to report. This is uh, maybe too much too late or but better late than never, I suppose. This, by the way, is a segment that will most definitely be cut from our entire YouTube version of this, because so for those of you who want to hear this, of course, you're listening to us already, our audio version, which is available on all major podcast platforms. We're on Spotify. We're on Google Podcasts. We're on Amazon Music Audible. We're on iHeartRadio. You can also subscribe to the various alternative video sharing sites that we are on. BitChute and Rumble for the full uncensored version of this. All right. So, so now that we've gotten the good news, the best news by far of the week out of the way, uh, Jacob, you want to tell us, want to take us back to a city that has not been in the news for a while now, that is now back in the news for the most frustrating but hilarious <laughs> of reasons? Okay. So, Charlottesville, Virginia. The mayor of Charlottesville has recently given us an example of the rift that we're going to start seeing more and more of between black identitarians on the left and white progressives. Uh, most people know about Charlottesville as the place of uh, the location where the University of Virginia is at. It's, it was the hometown of Thomas Jefferson, where he founded the University of Virginia. It was also the place where the Unite the Right rally took place in 2017, which turned into a complete riot once police decided to revoke the permit of the organizers and decided to push him out of the park where the statue of Robert E. Lee was set to be removed. And of course, one of the attendees ended up driving his car into a woman by the name of Heather Heyer, who was a leftist protester there protesting the people who showed up to protest the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue, and many of whom were extreme right-wing lunatics. But Charlottesville uh, stayed in the news because Democrats continue to use this event as some sort of almost they almost view it in a religious sense. You know, they view they because they really do view politics as the new religion. Joe Biden, in fact, claims that after watching the the hate that he saw in Charlottesville, this is what he, caused him to want to run for president. So he could. What, how did he put it, Eric? Restore he's, the soul of our nation. He's going to restore the soul of our nation. So because uh, I think there were probably 2,000 people that showed up for that um, that rally that were part of the Unite the Right. So out of a country of 330 million people, you had 2,000 to 3,000 activists show up with shields and baseball bats. And uh, there were a few people that got hurt. Uh, a bunch of people got arrested. You know, not really much in the news. I remember I went whenever I went back to Alabama, nobody was talking about it. And the few people who did, like – People that were around, they didn't really know what they were talking about. I could tell uh, people in my family, they had no idea that any of this had even happened. It was just kind of a localized thing and people who were political nerds knew about. But Joe Biden and the Democrats decided to run with it for a political game. So one of the things that came out of the Charlottesville incident is uh, the city of Charlottesville, which they have a city council that's elected to have five members. They choose a mayor to serve a two term to serve two year, a two year term. So in uh, 2018, after this was a few months later, they chose Nikuya Walker to be the first independent candidate that was elected to the Charlottesville City Council since 1948. So she's not a Democrat, but she uh, she was a black lady who was on the council, and the council voted four to one to make her the new mayor of the city. She became the first African-American female mayor of Charlottesville. And, of course, the symbolism was not lost on the white progressives of Charlottesville who wanted to prove to the world that Charlottesville is not a racist city. So they decided to make sure that the world saw that they were selecting a black lady as their new mayor. Well, Mayor Nikuya Walker has been in the news lately because she decided to make a controversial statement on Facebook. She posted. This was this story is from Newsweek. This was five days ago. She said she compared the, uh, the city to a rapist that tells you to keep its secrets. So she wrote, Charlottesville, the beautiful, ugly it is. It rapes you, comforts you, and it's cum stained sheets and tells you to keep it secrets. It covers your death with its good intentions. White people say that it is a place where gentrification started with the election of a black woman in uh, 2017. She misspelled woman. And because How did she spell it? How did she she spell it? Women, a black woman in 2017. And because of white power, a lie becomes hashtag facts. Its daily practice is that of separating you from your soul. 
Charlottesville is devoid of a moral compass. Charlottesville rapes you of your breaths. It suffocates you of your hopes and dreams. Charlottesville is anchored in white supremacy and rooted in racism. Charlottesville rapes you and covers you in sullied sheets. And, of course, she was called out for it by some people on Facebook, and she just doubled down. Of course, she's not going to apologize for speaking her truth, as it would be on her Facebook page. Of course, this is the mayor of a city, you know, the city where the University of Charlotte, of the University of Virginia is putting this kind of filth on Facebook. Now, Facebook, The university that Jefferson himself founded. You know, correct, Monticello is not too correct, far from Charlottesville. Correct. They've got a big statue of Jefferson and everything there. So Facebook removed her post for, cause for obvious reasons. But then they reinstated it later. I guess they wanted to prove to the world that they would leave profanity up if it was written by a black woman giving slam poetry to air her grievances. A spokesperson at the Charlottesville Public Relations Office told Newsweek the city of Charlottesville does not have a comment. But the the thing is, if you read through the supposed poetry that she wrote on Facebook, I mean, she's just absolutely trashing the city that elected her mayor. I mean, think about it. The the city elected her or the city council selected her to be mayor. She's supposed to be. The, you know the, the chief executive of this particular city, and she's just trashing the people and its residents, claiming that they're racist, even though they voted eighty four percent for Joe Biden. Which I, I thought that's that virtue, that kind of virtue signal, and I thought that was supposed to show that they're not racist. You know, they didn't vote for the quote unquote racist Donald Trump. They voted eighty four percent for Joe Biden. It's the but, same as the Obamas trashing America after they elected and reelected. Right, him, right. You know? It doesn't like if you're, and we're going to get into this later exactly why she feels this way. But, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, because, you know, after she was elected mayor, she felt that the race card was justification for race based bribery, which I found as I was looking into her history as the mayor of Charlottesville. So this is from Radio WVTF says no charges. This is from February 23rd, 2021. No charges will be filed against Charlottesville's mayor over her purchase of gift cards, which she gave to people testifying at public hearings. But reforms may be coming. So Mayor Walker bought twenty five dollar gift cards. And gave them to people to testify at public hearings last year. Now that's illegal. You you can't do that. You can't use. She's using the city's funds. She used the credit card that she was given. That's part of the you know that was paid for by the city to buy twenty five dollar gift cards and give them out to people so they could come testify at public hearings. So the she was under investigation for corruption. But the Commonwealth's attorney in Charlottesville said that the official policy on using city uh, credit cards is not clear, and he decided not to enforce their policy. Now, keep in mind, it's illegal to use city funds without the city council voting to appropriate those funds. But the Commonwealth's attorney is arguing that because the policy doesn't specify credit cards, then he's not going to pursue prosecution. He's not going to prosecute this mayor for committing an obvious, blatant act of corruption. Councilmember Lloyd Snook said a letter from Prosecutor Joe Plantania urges elected officials to fix that. He said, quote, we need to be sure that everybody on council understands that we don't get to spend money unless council as a whole votes to spend money. He proposed a law spelling that out more than a year ago when his term on council began. He said, quote, I was pushing for a policy that was more specific. That's when the mayor told me that I was being a white supremacist for raising the issue and nobody else was willing to stand up and make a fuss. So this time around, there's going to be a fuss made. So the mayor was taking the city's credit card, buying twenty five dollar gift cards to spend for people to come testify. This council member, um, Lloyd Snook, he was going to codify the law to make sure that it very specifically said you cannot use the city's credit card unless the council itself gives you permission to spend money and it designates what this money is going to be spent on. So and she went on a two-hour Facebook rant to her followers and justified her using the credit card. So obviously on face value, it looks like, okay, she's trying to help poor people in Charlottesville have a voice. So poor people have to work many times two jobs or they have to take care of family members. So it makes sense to pay them if they're under if they're underprivileged to testify at city council. However, that's not exactly what was being done. So this is from Charlottesville tomorrow. So Charlottesville Mayor Nakuya Walker admits to dispersing gift cards up to twenty five dollars to community members who have participated in local government solutions and discussions. The gifts meant to compensate people for their time and resources have been purchased using city funds which a recent memo from the, from the acting, acting city attorney, Lisa Robertson, has deemed outside of legal bounds. Meanwhile, Walker asserts that she was not made aware her actions were wrong. Okay, so who is she giving these $25 gift cards to? It turns out she uh, one of the people who received a gift card was Boyce Sims. Boyce, uh, Pamela Boyce Sims, an environmental activist associated with nonpro- the nonprofit organization Mid-Atlantic Transition Hub, 
So these aren't poor people who just want to come bring grievances like, hey, or we got potholes in our street. Can the city council do something to fill up the potholes so we don't ruin our cars that we spent two two thousand dollars on as an old beater so we can get to work? No, no, no. This is paying for climate and equity activists. So like Pamela Boyce Sims, she's an environmental activist associated with the non with a nonprofit Mid Atlantic Transition Hub. In her video and post to Facebook, Walker explained her reasoning to, for, for dispersing gift cards to guest speakers in, instead of the city's other process of contracting to consultants for solutions to local matters. What did I do? She asked speakers come and speak, typically about how to infuse equity into the conversation. And I pay them. Community members come up with solutions that people who are making 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 200 thousand dollars can't come up with. And I give them twenty five dollar gift cards for every hour that they spend and devote to helping us heal this community. You know, I, I mean, I'm sure race. I don't think you. I would call race baiting healing a community. But anyway, so as whenever this uh, council member brought it up to her brought, about fixing the the issue, you know, just codifying it, making sure that everyone understood that you can't use the city's credit card to do this stuff. She called him a white supremacist because, I mean, if if she if he criticizes anything that she says, of course he's a white supremacist. And then she later says, I wasn't aware that I wasn't supposed to be doing this. Whenever Lloyd Snook. Claims that he said I was going to try to make this, you know, codify this so everyone knows the rules. So, what is the typical conservative response to Miss Walker's post on Facebook? We get this from National Review's George Messenger. George Messenger is a fourth-year student at the University of Virginia, so he lives in Charlottesville, and he wrote a column in in our in uh, Nash, NRO National Review Online about how wonderful Charlottesville is. He said. Last Wednesday, Charlottesville, Virginia Mayor Nakuya Walker decided to tweet out a bizarre, self-composed free verse poem about the city. According to her, which, by the way, this she put it on Twitter first and then later doubled down on Facebook just so people aren't confused. But um, so he says, according to her, the, the anthropomorphized city of Charlottesville is raping its citizens. And then he goes on. He talks about our poem. And then he, but then he goes into this long winded explanation of how wonderful Charlottesville is. He talks about how people know each other in the stores, how they their neighbors, their friends. It's a wonderful town to raise a family in. It's a wonderful town to be a student in. Talks about how it's kind of a throwback to the old Americana of yesteryear. But he's missing her meaning. She's not talking about that Charlotte. She's not saying Charlottesville is like a rapist because the the people are mean to one another. She's referring to it as a rapist because of Thomas Jefferson and the history of Charlottesville and the history of America. And this is the typical. This is why when. So much of the time when black identitarians, they lob criticism at America and they lob criticism at white people, conservatives, they misunderstand them. And so they try to argue, no, it's actually things are actually good. We have opportunity. You can be anything you want to be in America. You know, people actually they wave at each other on the streets. You know, life is good, but they're missing the point. Like she's not arguing that people in Charlottesville are mean. She's talking about the foundation of the city like Charlottesville. They honor Thomas Jefferson. According to this lady, what she's talking about by um, calling it a rapist is Thomas Jefferson had sex with his slave Sally Hemings and had children with her. Okay, according to most historians, this was a long term relationship. Sally Hemings, uh, by according to some historians, at least when I was in college, they said that she may have even looked white, like she may not have even been a slave in Thomas Jefferson's eyes, even though he technically owned her. It was it wasn't uncommon back in those days. For a husband to buy a wife or a wife to buy a husband. This was just – this was the way the world worked back then. And so uh, she's arguing that Thomas Jefferson raped Sally Hemings and that this is a representation of Charlottesville and of the city of Charlottesville. So you would think that after being elected mayor, she would see that there's progress being made because even if she does see Charlottesville as this evil place that is in, in her mind like a rapist, you would think that she would say, OK, we're making progress because that's kind of the way that that's kind of the way white progressives think. You know, they, they think, OK, we're we've been a racist country in the past, but we are getting better. Things are improving and we see improve improvement by the election of Joe Biden. We see improvement by the election of more Democrats or more progressive Democrats. But uh, you think Miss Walker takes that attitude? Nah. In an interview with Charlottesville Tomorrow. She said uh, when asked if she thinks that things are starting to change for the better, she said, no, nothing has changed. Her straightforward response to the question of what meaningful change has taken place during her tenure, she said, I'm sure if there was um, someone else answering this question, they would celebrate the small victories. But I'm not that person. We have so long to go. And she was talking about the region's handling of the COVID-19 crisis and pointing out how white people are being vaccinated at a higher rate than black people. And this is an argument that if you – 
read around on the Internet, you'll find that a lot of anti-Semites take towards Jews. They argue that the reason that they'll you know, pull random statistics and say, oh, look, it looks like Jews are being vaccinated at a higher rate than whites. That must mean we live under a Jewish supremacy or we live under a you know, we live under a state in which white people are disadvantaged or Jews. Whichever prejudice a person has, they're always going to grab the data on COVID-19 vaccination and use it to try to prove their prejudice. If they think that the country is tilted in favor of whites, then they're going to look at the they're going to find some statistics and say, oh, look, it looks like only 60 percent. It looks like 60 percent of the this community's vaccination was done to white people, even though they only make up 30 percent of the city. And so this is one thing that she tells Charlottesville tomorrow, that it's because of systemic racism, that allegedly all these white progressives in Charlottesville are discriminating against black people, I guess, because they want black people to die of covid. So they're not vaccinating them fast enough when in reality, you know, I don't know. I've talked to people about the vaccine, about the covid vaccination just from my personal experience. Black people, at least around here, seem to be a little bit more skeptical of the vaccine than most white people are. Now, I'm sure if you go out into rural areas, you'll find that the skepticism among people, among white people in rural areas is just as high, if not higher than black people in urban areas. But it just it basically stems from trust of the state, trust of the institutions, urban white people who have higher levels of education, higher income. They tend to trust institutions more than people who are not at that high socioeconomic status. So it's understandable that black people and poor white people would be a little bit more hesitant to get the vaccine. Nobody's stopping people whenever they're signing up for vaccines and saying, nope, you can't be vaccinated because you're black. No, like nobody's doing that. That's not – unless you're a conspiracy you know, a conspiracy theorist and you think that the country is systemically racist, that's not a conclusion that anybody would draw. But it's this is kind of the mentality that they have. If you believe that a country is systemically racist, any kind of discrepancy, any kind of inequity, as they like to call it, is going to be blamed on racism. Now, you would think that after writing that kind of poem, there would be some pushback to this. But according to Wes Bellamy, a former Charlottesville vice mayor and interim chair of Virginia State University's political science department, he claims that most black residents of Charlottesville agree with the mayor's poem. This is from ABC News. It's talking about the poem. It says it points out how the poem ends by stating that the city of 47,000 Charlottesville is anchored in white supremacy and rooted in ra- and racism. Of course, it talks about how Charlottesville rapes you and covers you in solid sheets. So they interviewed Wes Bellamy. He said that Charlottesville has made a lot of improvement in recent years, but he said there are still many black people who lack hope and feel they have no opportunities. He said, I've had a lot of people say that she told it exactly as it is, talking about Walker's poem. He said, I've had some people say, help me understand why she used that language, like uh, cum stained sheets, that kind of language. But I haven't heard a person, this is him, he's saying, I haven't heard a person I've spoken to specifically, a black person, say that they did not agree with what she said. And this is something that obviously there's just crickets from white residents of Charlottesville. They're not saying anything. I mean, even a few counts, a couple of council members, their only complaint was that by using the rape metaphor that it might be disrespectful to victims of sexual assault. Like no defense of the city. You don't you don't hear any of these white progressives defending their city. Like no one's saying, no, that's not how Charlottesville is. Charlottesville is a wonderful place to live. But, you know, this is just this is par for the course among a lot of white progressives. They get punched in the face, punched in the face, punched in the face, and they just take it and take it and take it because they're under the impression that the people who are punching them in the face just want equality. But as we're going to find in a great episode from Undisputed when they were discussing Mark Cuban's decision not to play the national anthem at Mavericks games, that this isn't exactly the case. And just like I talked about how conservatives hear black folks complain, black identitarians, I'm going to specify, but not not all black people. Obviously, like Wes Bellamy, he had put out, a, he mentions that all the black residents of Charlottesville agree with him, but he actually put out a lot of tweets in the past that he had apologized for. One of them was that he can't stand black people who talk and act white. So it's very likely that he's going to interview black people who confirm his biases. But so obviously, you know, not all black people think like this, but the black identitarians, as we're going to see in this Undisputed episode, when they make complaints, white progressives, they hear one th- – they're listening to them, but they're hearing something else. And same with white conservatives like this you know, this student at the University of Virginia. He thinks that this mayor, Miss Walker, Madam Walker, is complaining about the way Charlottesville is, but she's actually complaining about the way America is. She's complaining about America's history. So let's uh, play this very telling episode from Undisputed. 
decision here. I'm perfectly fine with the decision. And guess what, Skip? No one even noticed it to a reporter brought it to everyone's attention, and not everybody seemed to be outraged. Skip, we got to stop with this notion that gestures and symbols is a form of patriotism. Actions, deeds make you a patriot. Just because you fly the flag over your house doesn't make you a patriot. Just because you drink Budweiser doesn't make you a patriot. Uh, I'm sure those people that went up on January the 6th on the Capitol, I'm sure they consider themselves patriots. And some of those guys were police officers, men and women, somewhere in the military, men and women. That doesn't make you a patriot. Skip, guess what? When I was in school, and maybe when you were too, we used to say the Pledge of Allegiance every morning. We used to say prayers every morning. Mm -hmm. They took that out of the school. And if I'm not mistaken, they still have school going on currently. Schools did just fine without the Pledge of Allegiance and without prayer in it. Mm. I think the uh, uh, sporting events will be just fine. I've never met anyone that says, man, I'm going to that sporting event. Once I hear the national anthem, I'm dipping. No, no. Skippy, look. And plus the anthem, what we found out, we've become a lot more politicized. And, it's you know, it's no more, you know, you, you choose a side here or there. There's no more straddling the fence. Skip the anthem, as, over the last four or five years, we see that it's mean, it means a lot of different things to a lot of people. And some people, it's their, it's their ethos. It's their, it's their code. They believe in it. And some people are like, nah, after listening to it and, what it, and the guy that wrote it and what he was writing it for, nah, I want no part of that. Okay, now here's the white progressive take the Star Spangled Banner. Okay, now this is just, again, me personally. Playing that song before any sports event became for years and years, decades and decades, centuries, mm -hmm. a backbone tradition of this country. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was a uniting bond for a country that, as I've said to you a thousand times on the show, we still have deep problems, obviously, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to racial justice facing this country. But I do still believe it's the greatest country in the world. That's just me. Yeah. You can choose to look at it however you want to look mm -hmm. at it. But to me, it's still a uniting bond for this country to stand before every sporting event and and respond to that anthem however you feel like it. If you want to put your hand over your heart, good with that. If you want to kneel, great with that. But it is our uniting bond. And I hate to lose that tradition across the board. I wouldn't. OK, I got it. I, I understand. This is my two cents because mm -hmm. that's just how I, I still love mm -hmm. my country right. for all its faults. Right. I got all the right. faults. And we talk. We've talked at length on the show about the faults mm -hmm. and the worst fault is racial justice. So Skip concedes everything. He talks about how it's OK to kneel for the national anthem, he talks about national guilt. So he says we're an imperfect nation, yada, yada, yada. But he's missing the point, just like a lot of the folks in Charlottesville I'm sure are missing the point that Mayor Walker is trying to make. Well, old Shannon sets him straight. I, I love the fact that they've been played. They started playing this in the 20s. I think they started playing it in the 20s at baseball games mm -hmm. while blacks were being discriminated against. Well, couldn't no play doubt. That sport. No doubt. But they played them. But, but, it. but, but it was a representation of America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. While blacks could yep. not play a sport, you felt very comfortable okay. with the representation. Skip, I got again. Okay. And I understand what you're saying is that it's been it's been done for so long. Let's just continue the tradition. But there are a lot of traditions that needed to be done away with. And we've okay. done away with some and we need to do do away with some others. But that flag is not a true representation of America. And you're right. America is a great country. Whoa, that flag. Did you hear that? I thought we were talking about the anthem. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute. Wait, I, I thought it was, it's a song. Hang on. Uh, maybe he's acknowledging maybe maybe that was a Freudian slip acknowledging that it's not just a song that the song represents the flag ah. ergo the flag represents something more because I, I got a comment he mentioned earlier it's like oh people listen to well, the song and they learn what the song was written about like they learn the real history of the song and i'm like okay wait 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 a minute so are you talking about the actual history of the battle that francis scott key was witnessing when he wrote that song and the idea being that it was about american resolve in the war of 1812 that even after all those hours are just bombarding that fort. The flag was still standing at the end of the day and illuminated in the night every now and then by the bombs exploding in midair. They still flew that flag, and that meant something. He's not just writing about a great big flag that looks pretty. He's writing about the spirit of this nation in its earliest days while it was still struggling to survive, and that's what made it so special. Maybe maybe he just kind of acknowledged that without you know, obviously not intending to, but that's what he just did. Well, what he's, what he's referring to is one of the later verses in Francis Scott Key's song or his poem at the time. Um, so when people want to prove that America is is wicked, evil, you know, systemically racist, they will reach back and grab any tradition that we have that we hold dear and they'll try to discount it. And one of the ways they did that with this with the national anthem is they grabbed some obscure line in one of the, like the third or fourth vo verse in that song. In which Francis Scott Key is talking about, uh, we can we can in the later episode we can pull up the national anthem and look at what exactly this is. But Francis Scott Key is essentially he hints that they're that the British have liberated or they're trying to liberate slaves 
or they're, uh, he's talking about – I think he's talking about in the impressed people that are in the British Navy. So obviously Britain impressed sailors and forced them to serve in their Navy. And Francis Scott Key is talking about the slaves on the ship, the people who have been, have been impressed, and people who want to try to – the revisionist historians, they take that and they tear it apart and they try to say, OK, well, Francis Scott Key is talking about the slaves that the British Navy had freed from America – and those slaves had joined up with the British Navy and were now fighting against the Americans, in other words, their former oppressors. And so Francis Scott Key, because he is an American fighting against these slaves who have been freed by the British, he is on the wrong side of history. Therefore, we should completely throw out the national anthem. It's I'm a very, so sick of that phrase, it's a right very, side of history. Well, I'm, it's a very, very weird – you've got to really, really twist yourself into a pretzel to try to find a way to make this. And the thing is I, that's not even what Francis Scott Key was talking about, which like I mentioned, we'll cover this in another episode. But that that's what he's referring to, and it's not even the main verse. Like nobody sings this verse. We only sing the first verse. Of the national anthem, exactly. The full song is like a lot longer than the actual anthem like, that we yeah, sing. Yeah, nobody even knows that that verse exists unless you go look up. I mean, a lot of people don't even know that there's more than one verse to the national anthem. But this is what he's talking about. Like, they, you have to really twist yourself into a pretzel to go back and try to discount. But this is kind of the goal. Anything that we hold dear about America, they've got to make out to be racist. But the fact that America will not acknowledge its flaws. That's the problem that a lot of black America and minorities have with America, is that you won't even acknowledge it. All you're saying Mm -hmm. is just like what's going on right now. Let's give President Trump a mulligan. Well, give America a mulligan. Okay, we gave you a mulligan, and you still haven't changed it. No. You keep telling us all lives matter. And when when people say all lives matter, tell me the year. Tell Mm -hmm. me the date. Tell me the month. Yep. Since 1619, that all lives matter. Mm. Because if all lives matter, there would have been no black slave. There would have been no slave. If all lives matter, they wouldn't have done what they've done to the Native Americans. If all lives matter, mm-hmm. there would have been no Asian concentration camps during World War II. Mm-hmm. So don't tell me mm-hmm. all lives matter when since 1619, it's never been all lives matter. Nope. There's only been one life that mattered. Agreed. I still think we have the greatest country in the world, despite all you said. You're you're so dead on right. It's horrifying to me everything you just said. I, I have zero <sighs> issue with everything God. you just said, but we can't give up. The fact that we still have a pretty great place to live despite its faults. But think about this, Skip. America is the only country, in the, only is, is the only is the only thing that says, okay, we're great, we're the best place in the world. Be content with that. They didn't do that with medicine. They got better and better with medicine. What? Yep. Medicine has gotten better from the twenties to the thirties to the forties. Mm-hmm. But only America gets to say, but we are the greatest country in the world with all her flaws. Yep. Let's stay in power because we're so great. No, why can't we improve like we proved on everything from the automobile to the refrigerator to the microwave? We tried to improve it, but only America wants to stay in power. <laughs> why? Because white America has been in power for four hundred plus years, and they don't want the changing of the demographic. It's never been about anything else other than that. Skip. They keep talking about economics. It's no okay. economic thing. Economic anxiety is racist. Anxiety. First off, Shannon, I'm going to stop you right there. We absolutely have improved refrigerators. Thank you very much. <laughs> Indiana Jones was able to survive a nuclear explosion in a refrigerator in the 1950s. <laughs> Thank how, you very much, How did you go from what is it, automobiles to refrigerators <laughs> to microwaves? To, I didn't know automobiles race. and microwaves and refrigerators were even combined. So we evolved from automobiles to microwaves. When was the last time you drove around a microwave, Eric? Oh, man, uh, that might have been uh, 2007. I don't know. I mean, microwaves, I, I love playing with microwaves. <laughs> Let's, yeah, we love melting stuff in the microwaves. I, I remember the first time I accidentally microwaved tinfoil, and I, for a few seconds of fascination, then horror when I realized I wasn't supposed to do that. Oh, that, that, was, that was Shannon's hat, wasn't it? <laughs> but no, seriously, I got to, first off, um, he, he started off that rant saying, like, oh, America never acknowledges their flaws. Like, this buddy you're with, this uh, Skip guy, he literally just acknowledged all of America's flaws. Uh, he's one example. There are plenty of Americans who do acknowledge our flaws. But apparently this guy either just has short to memory loss or he will not accept that. It's for the proof of what you said, Jacob, that they will never be satisfied. You know, even when we bend over backwards like this guy Skip is just shamelessly. Again, he's defending the anthem, which is good, but he still is bending over backwards. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, we're racist. Oh, yes, we're terrible. I'm sorry. Yeah, we have so many problems, but we're still great. But he's acknowledging all the problems, supposed quote unquote problems. And this guy's still not satisfied. Mm-hmm. That's just proof they won't be satisfied. So this is why my mentality, honestly, is to say to guys like this, Shannon guy and others, no, screw you. I think America is perfect and we've done nothing wrong. And my logic for that being, he, he talks about, there would have been no slavery. If this country was great, there would have been no slavery. Okay, there was slavery everywhere in the world in 1619, all right? The British Empire, the Native American populations, the original Central Latin American populations, the Aztecs, they all had slaves. Slavery has been around. Certainly as far back as when the ancient the Egyptians African tribes enslaved the that Hebrews. Shannon's ancestors came from had slavery. Africans enslaved other Africans. The ancient Egyptians enslaved the Hebrews thousands of years ago. Like it's just it's always been a thing. So in context of 
America versus every other nation. If there was no other slavery in the world besides America in 1776, then okay, sure, maybe, yeah, maybe you've got a point there. Maybe you have a point. But otherwise, I'm going to say no. America has done nothing wrong. Screw you. So this is a legitimate criticism of both patriotic progressives and Cold War conservatives that Shannon is making if you take what progressive patriotic progressives say and Cold War conservatives say and assume that that's the typical white view of America. So the right take, no pun intended, uh, nice. but the, the, ta- the take from the right wing of the political spectrum, the correct right wing, is that America is not the greatest nation in the world. There is no greatest nation in the world. It can be the greatest nation in the world to you. It can be your, you know, as as an American, you can love this nation better more than any other nation in the world. I know I do. But there is no objectively greatest nation in the world. The closest you will get is that there are there are individual hegemons throughout world history. There's a single world power. But There's that's military a, power. Like, military like, power. Like, right. But I mean that that is one metric. And of course I, I do – I will concede. I don't like conceding anything to these people, but I will concede. There's a point to be made that, OK, obviously, yes, we live in the present. We haven't seen the final pinnacle of humanity or civilization yet. You know, The Romans thought they were great. The Greeks were the original great society. Then the Romans – then it was kind of – then the Dutch were the world hegemon for a brief period of time because they had a great navy. Then you kind of had a back and forth between Britain and Spain before Britain emerged victorious, and then the British Empire up to World War II, now the United States. So yeah, of course we haven't seen uh, a thousand years from now if there's going to be a new Roman Empire type society. There's going to be floating cities and flying cars, whatever. Obviously we can't say that. But for right now, yes, America is for the time being, I think at least – the pinnacle of human civilization, certainly of Western civilization, until maybe another America will come along in another 300 years. Who knows? But see, yeah, as far as military – so if you just judge it in military power, but Shannon isn't just thinking of this in military power. And most of the progressives, the patriotic Americans, whether they're progressive or con- Cold War conservatives, that's not what they're talking about either. They're claiming it's the greatest nation in the world in every metric. It's the greatest nation in the world from a moral standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from you know, from a natural resources standpoint, from every standpoint. They're basically saying we are the best, we are the greatest that ever existed in every Every aspect. But whenever people claim make this claim that we're the greatest nation in the world, they're setting unrealistic expectations for America because there will always be other nations that do some things better. So what happens is people say, oh, you think we're the greatest nation in the world? Look, this country has a better health care system. This country has better rail transportation. This country has better airports. So and it also it keeps us from improving in areas where we're terrible, like rail transportation, for example. And it also it makes black people angry. Because all they've got to do is point to any – just about any black majority country and say, look, black people have it better there. So that's why that's why this really is a trap that Americans set them – that conservatives, that patriotic Americans of any political persuasion set themselves up for when they claim that we're the greatest nation in the world. Germans – many Germans think they're the greatest nation in the world. Many French people think they're the greatest nation in the world. Most people love – there. it's kind of like – here's a good way to put it. Most people on the right, like the truly right take is that a nation is basically an extended family. That is what a nation is. So I love my family more than I love your family. I will always love my family more than I love your family. If a per- When a man gets married, he's supposed to, at least supposed to, love his wife and believe that she is the greatest wife in the world. Now, is she the objectively greatest wife in the world? No, most likely not. But to him, she is the greatest wife in the world. That's the way it is with nations. To us, America is the greatest nation in the world because it is our home. We are Americans. So, but if you try to take a look at things from an objective perspective, people say, well, I love America because of freedom. Well, other countries have freedom. I love America because we have equality. Well, other countries have more equality. So this is the thing. You can't judge it by objective metrics and say we're the greatest nation in the world because of that. It's great. Because it's ours. That is what makes America great. And yes, we always improve it just like all people everywhere can improve their countries. But the criticism that Shannon is making is actually legitimate criticism that patriotic progressives and patriotic Cold War conservatives, when we had to be the greatest nation in the world, so you know, non-aligned countries would side with us over the Soviet Union, end up taking. But in, you know, a non when you don't have a Cold War going on, we're just the, we're the greatest country in the world to us. I will say that there is a uh, – before we move on to the next part of the clip, there was a hilarious video I saw just the other day of uh, Gavin McGinnis, the great Gavin McGinnis, in an interview with some woman, obviously a lefty. And uh, he was talking, oh, America is the greatest nation in the world. And again, he's Canadian, by the way, so that makes it even funnier. Uh-huh. But she was saying, oh, well, that's not true. There, there are certain nations that have – you know that are better than America in some ways. And he's like, well, wait. She's like, well, certainly a number of European countries have better health care than America. They have better you know welfare programs. And so she, he says – Oh, you mean countries that are mostly white? 
<laughs> and he's like, so you're essentially implying that the only way a country can be better than the United States is if it's an even more white country than America. And she just, the look on her face, she was just defeated. It was fantastic. Uh, I love Gavin McGinnis. Oh, yeah. I'm just going with my deepest instinct. And if you do away with the national anthem being played before every sports event across the board, it feels like the first sign that Rome is falling. Ding, ding, ding. I think Skip is missing the point of which Rome we were meant to be. We were meant to be a Rome the Republic, not Rome the Empire. And all empires fall eventually, and that was one of the biggest mistakes that Americans have made in history is by turning the United States into an empire. Our founders intended it for us to be a republic, and uh, that, that's just that's kind of a tangent. But he's not wrong. Skip isn't wrong that when you reject the flag, you reject the national anthem, and you basically say, this is not – my, this is not a representation of my country, even though the people who founded this country honored those things, then, yes, it is the beginning of the fall of Rome. Just all of a sudden, over the last four years, become racist. It's, that's not the case. Yep. It's been that way. But I do think we have made some progress in white America being enlightened as to why the black players, starting with Colin Kaepernick, were kneeling in the first place. I think that got completely lost 2016, 2017, right. 2018, and then slowly but surely... Through the last year or so, I believe, and this is just strictly my view from a distance, that a good portion of white America came around to say, OK, I, I get that. Yeah, they get you it. have the right to do that. You, you have you're justified in doing that. And what I also saw with a lot of white America, I get that, but I ain't ready for it. I don't want that change. Yep. Skip it, it, Colin Kaepernick told you what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Skip, if you go to someone's house and they tell you, well, this is this is chicken and this is turkey, mm -hmm. this is fish. And all of a sudden you choose to say, nah, that's lamb, that's venison, that's duck. Yep. they told you what it was. Mm -hmm. You chose to call it something mm -hmm. else to make it more palatable to you. Mm hmm. Your stance is where you are. So you're like, yeah, I get it. But I still, I believe you should stand for the flag. Even though he told you why he wasn't standing, mm. that still wasn't good enough for you. Mm. So Oops. hang on. So Colin Kaepernick kneeling is chicken and we're calling it lamb? Like, no, I'm, no, so I'm not, what, I'm not so, following this Okay, guy. so what he's saying, so for instance, the white progressives, they see black activists doing something, whether it's, whether it's kneeling for the flag or no matter what it is, and they say it's because they're being oppressed and they want equality. So they basically take their white liberal ideals and they project those ideals onto black activists and they try to align black activist goals with their liberal ideals. So Skip is arguing, look, white Americans have made progress. We have been enlightened to the we basically become awoken to what black Americans have experienced and the current experience of black Americans in this country. And we are reforming. We're trying to make things better. What he doesn't understand and what Shannon is so frustrated trying to make him understand is Kaepernick isn't kneeling because he wants equality. He's kneeling because that flag doesn't represent his people. And this is what Shannon is trying to explain. He's getting so frustrated trying to explain that anthem does not represent me or my people. It was written in a time when we had slavery and my people were enslaved, it started being played at professional sports games when my people were discriminated against. And now you're expecting me to honor that anthem and that flag? It's like, hell no, I'm not honoring that anthem and that flag because that doesn't represent my people. But the white liberal hears that and they think, oh, it's just because of police brutality. It's just because they don't have uh, the same standard, the same economic standard that white people do. We just need to throw more money at them. If we just give more money, if we they think that ch changing the situation of the current day is going to make it all OK. But in these people's eyes, you know, Shannon and, and Colin Kaepernick, th you can never make up for that history. Exactly. And it's like just like the mayor of Charlottesville, like the people, the white, which is it's over an overwhelmingly white city full of white liberals, most of them north, a lot of them northeastern transplants. They see the frustration and the anger among black activists who, by the way, at, at, typically when there's black activism, these activists are on the fringe. But because they are backed by corporate America, because they're backed by big money donors with a white guilt complex, they end up being able to expand their voice far beyond what they – I mean normally they would just be you know, fringe activists. But because of all the money behind them, they're able to basically represent black America – through these opinions. So white progressives in Charlottesville, they're like, OK, well, let's elect a black mayor. Let's put a black lady, this black activist on the city council. Let's make her mayor. And then that'll that'll fix things. That'll make things right. You know, we if we're represented by a black lady, she's the head of our city, then she'll understand that we really are trying to understand. We really are trying to change. But no, it, nothing changes in her mind. Everything's still the same. You know, white people are still racist. Charlottesville is still racist. The, the whole state and the country is still racist because 
you know, it, look, Thomas Jefferson still founded the University of Virginia. It doesn't matter who's elected mayor. Uh, you know, Virginia was still a slave colony. It doesn't matter who's elected mayor. And it's the history that you can't change. And this is why white progressives, they just they, they constantly want to project their ideals onto black activists. And black activists are like, no, that's not what we're saying. Like, you're, you don't get it. And so they're just talking past one another. And this is this is the situation. And this is the difference between white progressives and black identitarian nationalists. And this is something conservatives need to understand that you're dealing with two separate camps who, you know, who are trying who are basically in an alliance with one another, but don't like one another. Well, at least the the black identitarians don't like the white progressives. A very unsteady alliance united enough in their opposition to Trump. Correct. Now that Trump's gone, you know, that's this is something, you know, Conrad Black wrote an article the other day in American Greatness about this with Trump gone. That unity went with it, and now you've already got multiple factions within the Biden regime, certainly, but also within just the left in general, the multicultural left, just well, breaking apart. Right, right. Well, all of this, to sum up this one particular um, – this one topic of our podcast, all this drama could have been avoided if Charlottesville city councilors had simply selected another white liberal instead of Miss Walker to placate their white guilt. If they – all they had to do was select a white progressive. That white progressive could have put up a rainbow flag during Pride Week. They could have put up a Black Lives Matter flag during, in February. You know, they could have checked all the boxes of virtue signaling. They could have shown the world that they are a progressive, enlightened community, and they wouldn't have had to put up with all this drama. And, you know, and that's I think that's what's going to happen because her term, it's a two year term. Her term is coming to an end soon. And I think, you're, you know, you're going to see them. They're going to be like, OK, well, we we did our virtue signaling for two years. We, we endured Miss Walker for two years, and this is about all we can take. We're going to go back to having a white progressive. And, of course, she's going to cry white supremacy. She's going to say, look, these white liberals are just as bad as the conservatives. They're all white racist, and it's just going to be a continual cycle. And this is something that the right, you know, people on the right understand, that it is a continual cycle. There is no final, you know, there is no destination. It just continues to go on and on and on. It's been going on like this for decades, and it's going to continue to go on. You just have to learn to live with it. Well, and on that note, let's transfer back into another bit of good news, I suppose. There, there are a few things more satisfying than a leftist getting a taste of their own medicine. I, I, I will say, of course, cancel culture is out of control and it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. But the few times that it does come for the left, whether it's Ellen DeGeneres or any of those other people, I think it is immensely satisfying. And that was, in fact, the case in regards to the shooting we discussed, one of the shootings we discussed in last week's episode, the uh, Boulder, Colorado shooting, which was carried out by a Syrian, the son of Syrian immigrants, most likely Muslim individual, that killed 10 people. And of course, as you heard, the media initially thought he was a white man, and they ran with that story and said, oh, this is the reason the shooter was taken alive in a police custody. Then it turns out he's Muslim, and they're like, uh, okay, what, what shooting? Huh? What shooting? Oh, let's go back to Atlanta, shall we? So, USA Today's Hemal... Javeri, probably mispronouncing that, but who cares, said she was fired Friday. This is from Breitbart. <clears throat> After publicly asserting the Boulder, Colorado mass shooter would be an, quote, angry white man. The editor for, quote, race and inclusion at USA Today uh, responded to a tweet by Deadspin editor Julie DeCaro regarding the deadly mass shooting in Boulder, Colorado supermarket. Quote, Extremely tired of people's lives depending on whether a white man with an AR-15 is having a good day or not, DeCaro wrote. Javeri responded with the assertion that, quote, it's always an angry white man. Always, end quote. Police announced that the shooter was Syrian-born Ahmed Alawi Alisa, and Javari hurried to delete her tweet. She was not fast enough, however, to keep her job. By Friday, Javeri announced the outcry had worked and she was no longer associated with the outlet. Quote, I am no longer employed at USA Today, a company that was my work home for almost eight years. She wrote in an essay published on Medium. Oh, my work home. So sad. <laughs> yeah, she wrote this whole, this massive screed on Medium. Uh, Jacob, you've read through this uh, absolute dumpster fire. <laughs> Want to tell us about it? Well, I mean- as I'm wondering who exactly she's writing for. Like she's uh, she writes it as if we're supposed to be outraged that USA Today would fire. So, so she writes this medium post and basically complaining about how USA Today relieved her of her post, uh, which I was actually pleasantly surprised about. And they only did it after a Twitter firestorm by people that she refers to as alt right, which Dave Rubin. Like, 
Come on. Oh, yeah, he's been called alt-right before. I mean, like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the alt-right is anti-Semitic, or at least claims to be, and uh, Dave Rubin is Jewish, so they're probably not exactly the best representation of the alt-right. But anyway, she writes, uh, she says, like many BIPOC writers in newsrooms, and by the way, that's supposed to stand for Black Indigenous People of Color, I've also dealt with the constant microaggressions and outright racist remarks from the majority of white staff. Okay, so now she's throwing USA Today's white staff under the bus. They, they fired her because they're racist, apparently. Right, exactly. This, that's the only that's the only conclusion. I mean, because she wrote about race relations and she's not white in the traditional sense, so apparently it's because of racism. She writes, on two separate occasions, I was asked to edit a piece on young black golfers, but warned not to use language that would alienate white audiences. So because USA Today doesn't want to lose readers and therefore lose money, they're racist. In my first meeting with a new manager in the sports media group, he interrupted as I was informing him about my qualifications and asked, actually, can you tell me where you're originally from? That's a that's a microaggression for those that are for the uninitiated. She says there's also the USA Today sports editor who, upon learning his daughter was going to marry an Indian man, only spoke to me to ask questions about what it's like to be Indian, never about my actual beat as an NHL writer. Well, I mean, okay, so she's talking about a USA Today sports editor. So he's a co-worker. He knows that she's Indian and his son is going to marry an Indian lady. I'm sorry, his daughter is going to marry an Indian man. So he comes to her for advice. I mean, she's she's Indian. Who better? Who's going to be a better expert on Indian culture than an actual Indian? So it sounds makes, like he's being culturally sensitive. If he's anything. being culturally sensitive, correct, and he's just trying to be friendly. Like you're supposed to talk to your coworkers, you know, ask them about their life experiences, about their, you know, if they're from a different culture, just be friendly, you know. But this is the thing: if you're a BIPOC, uh, you know, race-based writer, if you're writing about race, then you have to be very, very people have to be very, very careful about how they word things because anything you say could reveal your inner white supremacy, and this is basically what she's suggesting. Don't you know that trying to be sensitive to other cultures is white supremacy, Jacob? I, Obviously. If you're, if you're white, it's uh, it's an example of white supremacy. But she says, I could go on. almost For almost eight years, plenty of incidents have piled up. None of this will be unfamiliar to other BIPOC reporters in newsrooms. The things I experienced are all too common, and reporters of color have to simply bear it as the cost of doing their jobs. She said, I have stayed as long as I did because of the incredible team I work with for at for the win, her sports section. Our small subsection has always backed me up and allowed me to push for real inclusion. So her official position at USA Today was the sports media group's race and inclusion editor. Why does the sports media group have a race and inclusion section? I mean, I mean, we just got done with the whole segment on how, you know, inequality is best represented through sports, like Colin Kaepernick. So, I mean, obviously, yeah, but clearly just, sports have to be politicized in this in this uh, 2021 America that we live in. Yes, that's true. Yeah, I guess so. But uh, not I mean, the thing is, uh, what's interesting is they hired her as the, the as the race and inclusion editor and they fire her for essentially doing the job that she thought she was supposed to do. I mean, what is a race and inclusion editor supposed to do in a white supremacist country other than call out white people? I mean that's kind of the that's kind of the implied job description. If I'm going to be a race and inclusion editor at a newspaper in the United States, my job is to call out white people and then I get fired for calling out white people or making the assumption that a shooter was white. I mean, I can understand from her worldview this is kind of where she's coming from. So, we see a lot of similar incidents where we have immigrants from Southeast Asian countries whose skin happens to be a darker shade than white and they automatically assume that they fit in with the not they fit in with black people they're going to be discriminated against because of the color of their skin because that's what they're sold and she's instead of identifying as an indian american as most indian americans traditionally have identified with whenever they become american citizens assuming she's an american citizen she identifies as bipoc because that is the new caste system in america so obviously she comes from a, from a culture that has a caste system you think about it if you're a, an indian immigrant and you're coming as a writer to America, what you're you're noticing a caste system being set up in America, where if you are black, indigenous, or you identify as a person of color, you are automatically put on a position higher than white people because you traditionally been oppressed. This has been a traditional traditionally white supremacist country, so you're going to have greater opportunities, uh, greater job opportunities. You're going to have your kids are going to have greater scholarship opportunities. You're going to be able to get into elite schools, whereas white students are only going to be able to get into like Notre Dame. So this is the caste system that she recognizes when she comes to America, when other Indians come to America. And so they figure, well, this is great because I'm not white. 
I automatically get to jump ahead of the line up on the the intersectionality cat. Which, by the way, the intersectional the inter- intersectionality that's basically just a caste system that they're trying to create in the United States. Who can be the the smallest minority minority in the country? Basically, right? Like, again, so- we talked about this in the last episode that you know on their tier, if you take white people out of the equation. They probably don't care much for Asians because Asians are again they, they're often they have the better test scores and better uh, household incomes. They're they're a more privileged class than certainly than African Americans or Hispanic Americans. So you, it's all just a race to the bottom, a race to you know, the oppression Olympics, as I call it. Who is the most oppressed, least privileged group in the country, as far as they're concerned? Right, but when you think about it, so this is this is an Indian lady who is an editor at the premier newspaper in the United States. I don't know what it is today, but I know in 2017, USA Today had the largest distribution of any newspaper in the entire country. And she's claiming, you know, she's basically trying to represent marginalized communities who she claims to be a part of. But yet, as you know, as a, as a an immigrant, she is actually in a more privileged position than the vast majority of Americans. But because they see this and this is the thing, this isn't about raising this isn't about raising marginalized voices. This is about creating a, a caste system whereby people are privileged based on their historical lack of privilege. So she says so many newsrooms claim to value uh, diverse voices. Yet when it comes to backing them up or looking deeper into how white supremacy permeates their own newsrooms, they quickly retreat. And this is kind of I think this is kind of a trend that we're going to see. Moving forward, because white Democrats were perfectly willing to tolerate all the anti-white racism while Donald Trump was president because it benefited Democrats. It helped Democrats. It weakened the it weakened the white vote. It weakened the conservative vote. It allowed them to unite behind a common cause. Right. But now that now that Donald Trump is out of the way, do they really want non-white people in their newspapers railing against how how racist they are just because they're white? No, of course not, because they – remember, they are the educated, enlightened white people. They are supposed to be the elites. Like they're the ones supposed to be at the top of the food chain. They definitely don't want these non-white people that they've promoted and ampl- whose voices they've amplified to end up undermining their own power. Uh, so if, if this happened during the Trump presidency, I guarantee you she would not have been fired. Oh, can, of course not. I can oh, guarantee you she'd she be, would still she, be have her job. She would get a promotion. Absolutely. She would uh, they would they would uh, pour more money into her department. But we see something similar with Medium. You know, we talked about, uh, of course, she wrote this on Medium. Medium, uh, for those that don't know, Medium has been uh, kind of a hub. It's the place where you go when you don't have any other outlet to write for. Let's be honest. Right, right. But it's also since the George Floyd riots, which even before then, but they really went into hyperdrive after the George Floyd um, death. They uh, Medium has become the hub for the anti-white woke writers, like some of the most radical the most radical anti-white racist writers that you could possibly imagine have flocked to medium since the George Floyd death. And uh, but interestingly enough, so just to give a brief background without going into too much detail, medium started out as a place where anybody could blog. So it was basically a blog that attracted a lot of eyes. Whereas if you wanted to be a blogger beforehand, you had to create your own web pr- a WordPress blog and maybe five people would visit it over a month's time. You know, maybe, maybe you would succeed. Maybe you wouldn't with medium you were already going to have a lot of eyes on your work. So a lot of people would flock to Medium and write articles just to you know kill time as a hobby. But eventually, as it got big, Medium decided to go to a subscription model. And people who subscribed could, ha- could make money off of their articles. And they also decided to create their own publications. So they got a publication on technology, another one on race and inclusion, a bunch of other different little subtopics. Well, those publications started to become more and more woke as the 2020 election approached. And two of their publications were just basically straight out anti, just vile anti-white racism. Well, recently with Donald Trump out of the way, they decided to make some changes. So Ev Williams, the CEO and founder of Medium, he wrote a Medium editorial team update on March 23rd. And basically it was an email that he decided to publish. He said, we announced a buyout and leadership change to the Medium editorial team today. Below is the email I sent to the company. So I'm not going to go through the whole email, but he just basically says, uh, team, we are making some changes to our editorial strategy and leadership and given a voluntary exit option to employees who would like to take a different path. And talking about how these publications, they're just not bringing in the bacon like they're supposed to. So the uh, so they they decided to let these editors at uh, their employees go with severance, uh, which basically means that they have gone along the path of get what go broke. So he says, so he writes, to be clear, we had no illusion that these publications were going to pay for themselves in the short term. The bet was that we could develop these brands and they would develop loyal audiences that would grow the overall medium subscriber base. What's happened, though, is the medium subscriber base has continued to grow while our publications audiences haven't. There are many potential reasons for this. 
which we could debate. Um, I, I've kind of got an idea of, um, for one of those reasons. <laughs> but uh, he goes on. I think a significant factor is that the role of publications in the world, not just on medium, has decreased in the modern era. Sure, 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 sure. I don't mean the role of professional editorial, but the idea of an imp- um, imprimatur that establishes credibility or trust. Trust is more important than ever, and well-established editorial brands still have meaning. But today, credibility and affinity are primarily built by people, individual voices, rather than brands. In fact, that describes the vast majority of what people read on Medium and is in line with our relational strategy. And he goes on to thank the people that have helped him in the publications. And we see this over and over and over again. This is with one liberal publication after another that has gone bankrupt or had to go out of business or had to downsize its staff, had to lay people off. You know, being a liberal journalist 10 years ago, was that was where it was at. You were going to make good money. You were going to get to do what you want to do. You were going to get to rail against the right. As time went on, though, people eventually began to grow tired of constantly reading about grievance culture, and they eventually started to move away from that. But also, in addition to that, a lot of millennials started to get professional jobs, so they weren't just sitting in a college classroom all day or they were sitting in a library all day or a Starbucks with nothing – to do once they finished up their homework, because that was really how a lot of these publications ended up making their money. You had a large generation of people, which millennials are bigger than Gen X. And this is kind of why we see a lot of unrest. You got Occupy Wall Street, you got the Black Lives Matter riots. Whenever you have a large generation that is much bigger than the other, especially whenever it goes through a recession, that is a recipe for a lot of social unrest. So you mentioned Julie DeCaro earlier. She's the senior editor at Deadspin. So she basically gave out the same tweet that this lady, Hamala Javeri, gave out. And then Javeri, was, her tweet was just in response to DeCaro's. So DeCaro was a senior editor at Deadspin. I didn't even know that Deadspin was back up. I found that out whenever I was, uh, whenever I was reading about this story. Uh, you remember Deadspin, Eric? That was that, uh, that was success, it was a fairly successful sports blog. I think we've talked about it offline before, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, – so, yeah, if you're if you're into sports at all, you, you know what Deadspin is. It was like – it was the most successful sports blog in the early 20-teens – it went down in 2019 because its staff couldn't follow instructions and stick to sports because they kept wanting to bash Donald Trump and write about politics more than they actually wrote about sports, like the stuff that sports fans care about. But uh, Deadspin was one of the tech revolution success stories of dirtbag pro- progressive politics that spilled over into culture. So Andrew Breitbart, he um, famously said politics is downstream from culture. Well, he was kind of late to the party. Progressives were already figuring this out back in the early 2000s. And Deadspin was an example of progressive politics, uh, which is basically the the vulgar kind, like the Vice News, um, uh, the Vox types. Huffington Post, Huff- Daily Beast. Yeah, like yeah. the old, the old uh. Huffington Post. This was an example of that culture spilling over into a non-political era, area, which is in this case it was sports. Uh, so that's been years before, uh, clearly many years before uh, Barstool Sports became a thing. Right, right. So, yeah, Barstool Sports kind of ended up taking it on and eventually took it down as we uh, which uh, which uh, which has been glorious to watch. <laughs> but uh, so Deadspin was founded by Will Leitch in 2005. Will Leitch wrote 40 blog posts a day at the time from his Brooklyn apartment. You know how boomer cons are always using the well, conservatives have jobs excuse for why they can't actually accomplish anything politically or culturally while they keep getting their ass handed to them culturally and politically. Well, maybe if a few conservatives in the 2000s had locked themselves up in an apartment and written 40 articles a day instead of working jobs, they'd have had more influence on their kids' culture instead of allowing the jobless Will Leitches of the world to do that. But uh, Will Leitch was a typical yuppie in his Brooklyn apartment writing 40 articles a day And founded Deadspin, and uh, Deadspin ended up being able to project Manhattanite, Brooklynite, hipster cultural values to the rest of the country, including the southeast, you know, even into areas that where the SEC is popular. Uh, Well, when Great Hill Partners acquired – it was part of Gizmodo Media Group. When Great Hill Partners acquired Gizmodo and renamed it GO in 2019, uh, Deadspin wasn't quite getting the clicks that GO wanted. So Geo's management, they looked at the at the model and they're like, what are these guys doing writing about politics? So they're uh, they wrote out an, uh, an email to their employees and said, just stick to sports. Well, in typical millennial spoiled, rotten, yuppie fashion, they decided to pitch a collective fit and resign. And so Deadspin went offline and which, uh, of course, allowed Barstool Sports to uh, completely claim total victory over their arch enemy. Apparently, it came back in the spring of twenty of twenty twenty. Like I said, I didn't even know that Deadspin was a thing anymore. I thought that, that I didn't realize they'd come back. So it came back in like March or April of twenty twenty, and by May, it was getting about ten point two percent of its peak audience back. Uh, this is according to Comscore. 
They hired DeCaro that month in May, and she hasn't done much to bring things up because after a year of renewed operations, I checked uh, the the website tracking site similar web and apparently they're up to 10.9 percent of their 2019 peak audience so the moral of the story is you get woke you go broke you know that needs to be understood by people who want to make money nowadays you know unfortunately this wasn't the case 10 years ago back before uh intersectionality took over and black nationalist woke culture took over and really when you think about it black nationalism it really is what killed the millennial progressive revolution because this was like Deadspin and all these other Gizmodo Media Group, all these other major blogs of the early 2000s and 20 teens, they were pretty much the only game in town. I mean, conservative media was just just getting the crap kicked out of it until woke culture decided to take over, and then it divided the writers between black and white. Because at the time, if you were you were progressive or you're conservative, that that was it. It didn't matter your race. You know, at the time we were kind of in this Obama era mentality that. We've moved past caring about people's race. Now we're just we're all Americans. Well, once black uh, the Black Lives Matter movement took off, it completely destroyed that model. So now you have a situation like in Charlottesville where you've got a black nationalist mayor who is putting out vulgar tweets comparing her city that she's the mayor of to a rapist. And you have, you know, sports sites falling apart. And then and then you have a situation where like two progressive well, people that who previously would have been considered progressive like Skip and Shannon arguing about whether or not we should do away with the national anthem. Because this is something conservatives need to understand. Progressives, most progressives, are not anti-American. They do not hate the United States of America. They are progressive in their politics, but they still love this country. Many of them are progressive because they want better roads, better sidewalks. They want bike paths. And they see progressives as the only one. They want light rail. And they see progressives as the only ones talking about that stuff. So they join the progressive camp. The black identitarian element within the Democratic Party, however, does hate this country. It does hate this country's history. It does hate the majority of this country's people. And therein lies the rift between those on the dirtbag left, the progressive left, who were part of the Bernie Sanders coalition, and the black identitarian movement, or Black Lives Matter, which is basically just using white progressives to air their grievances and attain racial power. You saw this even back in the 2016 Democratic primaries when Bernie and Hillary were kind of going head to head and Black Lives Matter rioters literally like stormed his stage. And, you know, he released that one ad that was literally just called America. And it was just a montage of mostly white working class families and farms and whatnot. And it was playing patriotic music. And the Democratic National Committee, which, of course, we now know was biased against Bernie from the start. They literally released a statement saying this ad proves that black lives don't matter to Bernie Sanders. Like, it's <laughs> it's always, even back then, you know, Bernie, to some degree, had those kind of more patriotic undertones, which I never really thought of it like that, but you are right the more I think about it. You know, we usually identify the left with anti-Americanism because they are the ones pushing critical race theory, America's racist, rah, rah, rah. But the idea that some of them don't really believe that and they're just going along with it, that is very interesting. And I think if nothing else, nothing else we can it's- always rely on the left turning on each other and the various factions getting so power hungry that they start eating each other alive. And we may not be able to defeat cancel culture itself, but cancel culture may defeat itself and defeat its own proponents. And that may be exactly. the opening that we need in order to maybe come back in 2024 or otherwise in the near future. But that is all the time we have left for this episode of The Right Take. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And until then, happy Easter, and we'll talk to you next week.